Bible, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and we'll read a verse of Scripture there. And we'll jump into probably one of the, uh, uh, one of the most exciting, one of the most fun, uh, one of the most uh, 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 lovely subjects uh, dealing with the church. Is, okay, uh, I'm trying. I don't know. We're going to talk about church discipline tonight, okay? Uh, church, the church and her discipline. Uh, we've been talking about different aspects of the church uh, on Wednesday night, dealing with it, looking at that from the Scriptures. Uh, and, you know, sometimes you don't know, when, when you talk about church discipline, normally you don't know whether to pucker or duck. You know, because it, people are either for it or against it. I mean, it's just, you know, and usually there's no middle ground. You, you start talking about church discipline and either, you know, oh, bless God, preacher, we got to stand for the truth and we got to stand strong or you get the other side of that. You know, you're just mean-spirited and, you know, you don't love people and, you know, and, and, and I've heard both sides. Uh, I've been... I've probably been, I've probably been called some things that you wouldn't you, that you uh, probably wouldn't think about. I know I've been called some things that I would not repeat from this pulpit. But <laughs> but anyway, but anyway uh, just any idea of church discipline. Now we'll start off with this idea. Well, let's read the let's read the verse, uh, and then we have some introduction that we'll do, uh, and then we'll we'll jump right into uh, just looking at the scriptures. Second Corinthians chapter two, ver- uh, chapter eleven, verse number two. Look at this. Uh, look at what it says. For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Now, as we read that verse, and, and, and really I know, I understand, I just kind of pulled that verse out, but I wanted to get a thought from that so we can understand the direction and what we're talking about when we talk about church discipline. The desire there is that the church would be clean and pure as it's presented to Christ as a virgin presented in marriage to her husband. So so the idea there is to be without spot or blemish. Now, uh, let me say this first. I'm going to say this right up front. Uh, You know, that scripture that's in the Bible that says, He who is without sin cast the first stone. ain't, Ain't none of us in here without sin. Right? So we're not talking about in a church setting, we're not talking about being perfect. Right? Because we're all going to have difficulties and we're all going to have issues and we're all going to have problems. What we are talking about tonight is how we handle those difficulties. How we handle those problems. And you've heard me say this before, and anytime that I talk about church discipline, I always try to make this statement. Because... If we as individuals could discipline ourselves, we'd never have the need for church discipline. If we could get in the Scriptures and let God deal with our hearts and discipline ourselves, it would stop right there. All right. Sometimes that doesn't happen, and then we've got to go to the Scriptures and find out the direction God gives us for handling things according to the Bible. All right. So let's start with this idea uh, of, of defining what we mean when we talk about church discipline. I looked up the word discipline in the diction in, in the, the Webster's 1828 dictionary, uh, and it gave me five different definitions. I, I'm going to read them to you. Number one is to instruct or educate. To instruct or educate. To inform the mind, to prepare by instruction in correct principles and habits. So the first idea or the first uh, 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 dealing with discipline, the first thing is you've got to know how you're supposed to live. You've got to educate. There's got to be some instruction. Uh, Definition number two is this, to instruct and govern, to teach rules and practice and accustom to order and subordination. We've got to understand that idea of being subordinate to Christ. Number three is this, to correct, to chastise, and to punish. Now, that's the one that most people, when you start talking about discipline, that's the one that most people hang up on. All right? But you understand, there's two more before that. If we take care of the first two, nine times out of ten, we wouldn't get to number three. All right? Number four is this, to execute the laws of the church on offenders with a view, now catch this, with a view to bring them to repentance and reformation of life. I've seen a lot of preachers that focus on that first part to execute the laws of the church on offenders and they're big on that, but they forget what the purpose is. 
The purpose is, and he talks about the view to bring them to repentance and reformation of life. Number five is this, to advance and prepare by instruction. So, I, I, you know, the, what's the purpose? Why do we talk about church discipline? What's it for? Why is it used it, when it is used? Uh, what's the goal? What are we after? Well, the goal, and he talks about that in the definition, is restoration. And, and we'll talk about that as we go through. But, but I looked up the, the, the definition of the word restoration, and here's what I found. While we are to practice church discipline through education, through instruction, through correction, through, through trying to win them back, that's the goal. It, restoration is the act of replacing in a former state. Church discipline is not just to be mean-spirited and ugly, but it's to, to cause that individual to have to make the decision, are they going to get right with God, or are they going to stay in their sin? That's what church discipline is all about. It's about confronting folk with where they are and what's going on in their life, and the possibility and the ability to come back to Christ. It's a renewal or a recovery. Uh, that's what restoration means. So when we talk about church discipline, we cannot separate the idea of discipline from restoration because that's what it's all about. When you start entering, entering into church discipline just for the sake of discipline, or you enter into church discipline just for the sake of keeping your church pure, or you enter into church discipline just because they're wrong, you've got the wrong motive, the wrong heart, the wrong spirit. And unfortunately, that's the way most Churches practice that discipline. I, I've heard in the past, I've heard preachers talk about what they call backdoor revivals. And it burdens my heart when I hear that. Now let me explain what they mean by that. By backdoor revival, they mean that when people that they uh, can't get along with leave the church. And I've seen some preachers be excited about having uh, what they would call blessed subtractions. Folks, it ought to burden our heart. You know, number one, if we can't get along with somebody, that ought to be a, a sign to say, you know, what am I doing? What's my part in that? It's easy to say, well, if they just get right with God, but if you'll read your Bible, you'll, you'll find out that it's a two-way street. We've got to learn how to evaluate, look, and watch. All right, so let's just jump in. There's three types mentioned in the Scripture uh, about church discipline. Three ways, three things that we need to look at. Number one, we need to look at the public offense. So take your Bible, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we'll start there. And I'm glad that these are just spelled out very carefully and very clearly in the Scriptures. It's not something that we got to guess on. It's not something that we've got to put in our bylaws and make up as we go along and just try to do the best we can. God understood. He wrote it down for us. All right? So let's look at this. What's called, number one, the public offense. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Look in verse number 1. We're not going to read all of it at once. We'll just read through the, some of the verses and, and look at what it says. Now you understand that when Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, the first epistle, he wrote to dress them down. Really, he did. He wrote to them, if you'll read 1 Corinthians, and we're going to read some of it here, he wrote to them to, 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 to pinpoint and reveal some things that were going on in the church that did not need to be there. That was his whole purpose of writing. Now, thank God we've got 2 Corinthians, because in 2 Corinthians we find out that they fixed what he talked about in 1 Corinthians. It worked. They responded. All right? But in chapter 5, we find very, very definitely, very clearly what he's dealing with. He said in verse number 1, chapter 5, it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. Now, he gets very specific here. But not only does he, does he pinpoint the sin or name, but he even talks about the type. I mean, he, he's, he's on it. All right. The first thing we've got to understand in this idea of the public offense, number one, is it's commonly reported. The idea there in verse number one is it's not a secret. Everybody knows it. 
Everybody knows. See, when things are going on and everybody knows it, then you need to do something about it. There needs to be a response or an action to that because if everybody knows it's going on there, and you don't do anything about it, then what they're going to think is, well, you must be okay with it. You know, now I'm going to pick on Miss Katie. She's used to it. It's okay. She won't get mad at me. And if she does, she'll get over it. See, see if Miss Katie went out tonight and got falling down, slapped drunk. <clears throat> and everybody knew about it. Well, then we'd have to do something. We'd have to respond. That's just what we'd have to do. You know, if, if she decided to, <coughs> if she decided we got home to, <coughs> I just got choked up there thinking about it. If, if she decided when we got home tonight to slap her daddy around a little bit, you know, and just kind of whoop up on me some. You know, and I come to church to Sunday with a big black eye and all, you know, all beat up and Katie did it. You know, well, then everybody would know about it. It'd be obvious. And, and that means that there has to be a response to that. Something needs to be done. So what do we do? What does the Bible say that we do in response to that? All right. So verse one, it talks about the idea of a commonly known, commonly reported difficulty or problem. He goes on, look at verse number 2. Uh, it says, And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. Now, there's an opportunity here for restoration. He said what you ought to do is you ought to mourn, and you ought to have a, a heart for them, and you ought to reach out to them and try to help them. But if you don't, and if they don't respond, he, he goes on and says this, what we have to do, it says that he might be taken away from among you. The action that needs to be taken, number one, according to verse number two, is there needs to be a removal from that individual. They, that, that idea of being removed is the idea of being disowned or a refusal of ordinances. That means don't be involved in the activities of the church. What they're having to do, you're saying, look, if they continue and won't repent and won't get right and stay in that way, what you have to do as a church, we're commanded by God uh, to, to be removed from them, to not be involved in what they're doing. So what's the purpose of that? Why would you do that? But we'll just keep reading. It get, he, he explains all that. For, for I verily, as being as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that had the, so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. He's saying, listen, this is what we need to do. The next thing is, uh, we need to back off from them, but we need to deliver them or turn them over, as he says in verse number 5, unto Satan. And the idea here is, you just back off, you turn them over to whatever vice that they're involved in, that through the hardships of that, they may find Christ, they may find spiritual help as they begin to realize the toll that it's taking on their physical body. You know, sometimes we help too quickly. I was talking to a, a couple from, from Gulfport a couple of weeks ago uh, about spiritual gifts. And, and one of the spiritual gifts, uh, the gift of mercy uh, and the gift of giving, one of the one of the downsides of the gift of mercy and the gift of giving is that too many times those folks that have those gifts help too quickly. They supply the need too quickly. While God's doing a work in someone's life, they want to meet that need and fix the problem. Well, maybe God's not ready to fix the problem. Maybe God's using the problem to get that person's attention. We've got to be very careful. Now, let, let, me, let, me, let me, Miss Amy, if you don't mind, I, I, I'm going to use Brother Kevin as, a, as, an, as, as an example. But I had a conversation with Brother Kevin Monday. And I want to tell you what I told him. All right? And I need to tell you this because I need you to have my back. All right? Everybody just look and smile at me. It'll be okay. I went in. I sat down with Brother Kevin. And when he first sat down, he wouldn't look at me. He looked at the floor, he looked at the wall, he, he didn't want to look at it. 
We made a little small talk at first. And I said, Brother Kevin, I need to tell you something. He stopped and he looked up. I said, Brother Kevin, I want you to know I love you. And we just kind of sat there in silence for a second. I said, Brother, I love you. And I want to help you. And I want you to know, and here's, I need you to have my back right here. I said, I want you to know there's a church that loves you. And there's a church that cares about you. And what we want and what we desire is that you straighten some things out and you get where you need to be. And we want to do everything that we can do to support you and your family and help you. And I sat there and I looked at a man that knows. You can see it in his eye. He knows. Now, he's still dealing with some things. And he, and he needs some help and he needs some leadership and he needs, he, he needs some counsel and, and I agree with that and I understand that. But you could see it in his eye. He wants to do right. I talked to him for a few minutes and, and I'm not going to get into everything we talked about, but we had a good visit. And I was encouraged. Yeah, there's some things to work on. But I've been in too many churches. I've been in too many churches that in this position, the first thing that they'd want to do is to distance themselves from Brother Kevin. Now, if I'd have gone in there and I'd have sat with him and he'd have told me, Preacher, I don't care what you say. I wasn't wrong. I didn't do nothing wrong. I, you know, and, and if he'd have been very obstinate and very belligerent and all that stuff, it'd have been a different story. But I sat there and I looked at a man who knew what he'd done and knew that he needed to do something different. Now, what we have an opportunity to do is to help. The biggest thing you can do right now is pray. After the 14th, we may have some other things we can do. But until then, we pray. We pray. If you get an opportunity... Now, now I'm going to ask you to do me a favor. I think I can go down there and it's not going to cause a problem. But I'm going to ask you to do me a favor. Before you go down there, talk with Miss Amy. Because if it's going to keep her from being able to go, I'm going to ask you to stay away. I don't understand that, preacher. Talk to me after service. I'll explain. But just trust me on that. We we need to, we need to understand what we what we can do. Our part. We're, we're not in the place yet to where it's time just to say, "Well, we're going to walk away. We're going to turn him over to say, No, 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 no. We're seeing repentance. We're seeing we're seeing remorse. We're, we're seeing uh, you know that, that there's an opportunity to help and reach out. We, we need to do that. So, so don't leave this place this morning, this evening, and think, well, you know, he's just he's ready to turn his back. He's ready to go. He's ready to put Brother Kevin in this in this position. No, no, I'm not. Again, if I if I would have gone there and he would have, I probably still wouldn't be ready. But if he would have, you know, been very belligerent and very, you know, ugly and all of those things, I probably still wouldn't be ready yet. But you know, that that that's a different story. So as we go through these, we'll find. The different stages that he talks about in doing something uh, to, with someone that, that just will not respond, will not repent when it is a public offense. We're gonna, we'll are going to get to the private in a minute. So don't, you know, I, I know you're thinking, no, the Bible says you go to them and you take somebody else. We'll get there. Okay, just hang on. He goes on and talks about this, verse 5, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the Spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glorying is not good, knowing ye, know, know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, uh, as ye are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Verse 7 says what we need to do with those unrepentant is to purge them 
or, or to cleanse them thoroughly. Remove them. Why? Because if you don't, that sin, that leaven is going to affect other people. It's, now, it may not be the same sin even, but it's going to creep in if, if we don't take care of that and we don't seek to live righteously before God, it's going to affect everything about us. He says in verse number 9, I've taken way too much time for this, he said in verse number 9, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. Not to company, is not to be mixed up, not to, not to be intimate with. Right? Not to be involved in their sin. There's a, there's a difference between loving the sin and loving the sinner. No, we need to hate the sin and love the sinner. He goes on finally in verse 13, he says this, But them that are without God judges, therefore put away from among you yourselves that wicked person. The, the idea here is if they will not repent and will not return, then you have no other option to remove yourself from them. Number one, that you don't give credence to what they're doing. Uh, number two, that you don't show the world that you agree with them. And number three, that it doesn't affect you personally. First Timothy chapter 1, verse number 20 uh, is just an example of that. First uh, Timothy chapter... First, I turned to Titus, goodness. First Timothy chapter number 1. Uh, I'll just read this verse to you. Verse 20, it says, Of whom is Hymenaeus and, Al and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. And then we just find that's an example given where this was take had taken place. Uh, the unrepentant, uh, 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 unwilling to respond. Uh, so they turned them over to Satan. Uh, that through that, through the, the, the dealing with the flesh, uh, uh, that we might win the spirit. Uh, and we've got to understand, now we never give up on them. Uh, we always try to reach them with the gospel. We always love them. But there comes a point in time where you have to back up from them, remove yourself from them. The second idea is the idea of the personal offense. Now this is the one that's most common. Most people talk about this one. Uh, this is the one that you hear about most of the time. Uh, it does differ from the public. And you understand the public offense, the reason it's different is because of what it said in verse number one. It is commonly reported. All right? It is well known. The personal offense, usually nobody really knows about that but two people. Those that are having problems with each other. All right? So there is a process in the Scriptures that's given to deal with that. That is in Matthew chapter 18, uh, verse 15 through verse 17. Uh, very quickly, you know this one. I'll hit it fast. Number one, the Bible says this in verse number 15 of Matthew 18. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. Uh, if he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. All right. So the first thing to do is if there's a problem uh, between two brothers, see, here's how it ought to work. Uh, if Brother Chipman and I had a problem with each other, uh, we ought to meet each other halfway between our houses, going to each other to try to reconcile that difficulty. If he and I had a problem, and we know we have a problem, if we're going to live according to the Bible, then we're going to meet each other halfway trying to get this thing resolved. That's what the Bible says we need to do. See, but the flesh says, well, I didn't do anything wrong, bless God. If he wants to get right with me, then let him come do it. Well, I got a little bit of a problem with that. It's called the Bible. If you just swallow your stinking pride, somebody say amen right there. If we just swallow our pride and get right with God ourselves, see, we got just as big a problem as we think that other guy does then we would do what God says to do. It says to go alone and seek to reconcile with that brother. Now, if that doesn't work, verse 16, he gives us the next step. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. I, well, I'm not going to hear it. We're not going to fix it. I'm, you know, so now you bring someone with you, uh, and you have a witness that you sought to correctly. <laughs> there, there's a big key, right? Correctly try to... Talk with them and reason with them uh, and get things straightened out and settled. Now look, going and chewing them out and yelling and screaming at them does not constitute trying to work things out. <laughs> just, that don't work that way. All right, You've got to go in the right spirit. You've got to go with the right attitude. You've got to go to work things out. And then it says in verse 17, if that doesn't work, and if he shall ne neglect to hear them, 
tell it unto the church, but if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. So we find the third step in this personal offense. Once you go personally, uh, if it doesn't get worked out then, then you take someone with you, and usually you try to take someone uh, that's got a little wisdom. Uh, usually it would be a, 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 an older a gentleman in the church, maybe an, an elder if you want to use that phrase, maybe a deacon, maybe the pastor, whatever, whoever it is, and you want to take them. And, and the reasoning is not to gang up on the other person, but you want someone there that can reason uh, with a cool head and try to help reconcile that problem. And then if that still doesn't happen, then you go to the church, uh, you bring it before them, uh, and, and you let them know what's going on. Uh, and then if they won't hear the church, then the Bible talks about uh, how, how you respond to them. And it's basically, it says, let him be unto thee a heathen and a public, and it's the same thing you withdraw and you, and you pull away. Again, why? Why do you do that? Number one, he said it in verse 15, you would do that to gain the brother. You want reconciliation. That's what you want. But the second reason you do that is because you cannot, we cannot allow division to sneak into the church however it tries to get in. You, you, we, we cannot allow that Satan to have that foothold or have that stronghold of division. I told you the other day about the church that, that I heard about in Texas that had the problem over the piano. I mean, how ridiculous is that? You know, we got. I'm afraid I'd have just got rid of the thing. We'd have sung a cappella. You know, I mean, move it to one side, and if one group gets there first. Move it to the other side if the other group gets. That, that's crazy. That's ridiculous. You know, but I have seen churches. I was in a church one time that I thought we were going to split over the chandeliers in the building. We had sold the building. We were moving. Half the church wanted to take the chandeliers down out of the. They've been here since we built this building. And we want to take them with us. I want to tell them, look, bless God, if you want them, you get the ladder out, you climb up there, you take them down, they'll go. I ain't touching them. I wasn't pastor then. I probably could have said that and got away with it. But uh, anyway, you know, I, seriously. And my wife, if I remember correctly, if I remember correctly, I probably still have it somewhere. I think my wife wrote me a note in the middle of all that. Uh, and I looked at it and she said, you know, people are dying and going to hell and we're fighting over lights. I mean, I've heard, I've heard folks fighting over what color toilet paper they're putting in the church. What color carpet? What color, yeah. It, it, listen, I'm going to say this and we'll move on. I got to show. Satan doesn't care what kind of, what it takes to bring division. He don't care. Pews or chairs. He don't care. As long as he can wiggle his way in there. It don't matter. Not to him. So we have the public offense. We have the personal offense. And now listen, if, if you heard me correctly in both of those, you heard me say, we want to regain the brother at all costs. But, if that's not possible, it comes to a place where we have to stand and separate ourselves for the cause of Christ. There's one more, uh, and this one goes very quickly. Uh, it's in Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3, and, it, and it's dealt with completely differently uh, than the, the, the first two. Titus chapter 3, uh, I'm going to read verse 10 and verse 11. I'm just going to read them, uh, and then we'll come back and, and talk about it just for a moment. Titus. There, right uh, after the book of James, uh, I mean, after the book of Titus, right before the book of Hebrews, uh, Titus, Timothy in Hebrews, Titus chapter 3, verse 10 and verse 11. Listen to this. A man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition reject, knowing that this is su knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself. He says in verse 10, 11, the third way, the third thing about church discipline uh, is this idea of heresy or being a heretic. Uh, the definition of a heretic is this. It's one that obst uh, ob obst obstinately, can't say that word, one that obstinately uh, uh, is, is obstinately attached to an opinion contrary to the peace and comfort of society and will neither submit to Scripture nor reason. 
All right. So the idea of a heretic is someone that believes something contrary to the Bible and is unwilling to listen or to change. Someone that believes something that is not true according to Scripture, he gives us direction of what to do. All right. And he says this, and number one, he talks about this again to admonish them. See, if you'll notice the pattern, the pattern is the first thing you do is you love them, you tell them you love them, and you try to work with them. That's what he, God wants us to do. The, the motive of just a backdoor revival or, or the idea of blessed subtractions, that's not in the Bible. We've got to love people. He says to admonish them, and he says to admonish them twice. What does that mean? To admonish them. To admonish them is the idea of a mild rebuke or warning. It's the idea of taking the Scriptures and saying, this is what the Bible says, this is where where we stand, and this is what we teach, and if you cannot agree with this, then we're going to have to separate ourselves from you. Let's use this uh, uh, as an example. Uh, let, let's say we have, I'm not going to pick on anybody specifically on this one, but let's say we had somebody come in here uh, and they decided they wanted to start teaching that you had to be baptized to be, to, to, to be saved. Well, the first thing that I would do is I would go to them and I would take the Bible and I would very, very clearly show them that the Bible teaches that salvation is by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast, that, sal- that, that baptism has no part in your salvation. It is obedience, and we'd go through the whole thing. I would explain it very carefully, uh, and I would ask them to consider what I've said, pray about it, and, and we'll talk in a couple of days, and I'd give them that opportunity to study the Scriptures, look at it, and decide exactly what they be, feel, believe the Scriptures teach. A couple of days, I'd go back. If that individual still says, I don't see it, I don't believe it, you've got to be baptized to go to, to be saved. Probably what I would do is I would probably get a couple of the deacons. I'd go back to that individual. We'd sit down again. We'd go over the whole thing again. Not ugly. Not mean. You know, not matter of fact. Not I cannot believe you can't see this. What's wrong with you? No, but just lovingly sit down with the Scriptures. Walk through it again. Show him very clearly what the Bible says about the subject. Again, I would probably say, look, you need to pray about this for a day or two. Let me know what you think. A couple of days later, I'd probably take the same deacons with me. We'd go back and find out his response. If he said, I don't care what you say, preacher. I'm not changing. This is what I'm teaching. This is what I'm doing. Next step would be me standing right here talking to you about Titus chapter 3, verse 10 and verse 11. And what my my suggestion to you, or my leadership to you, would be, according to this, I've gone, I've gone with a couple of the men, we've talked to him, we've explained it to him, he will not respond, he will not change, he will not get right with the Word of God, we've mildly rebuked him, we've warned him, so the next step in that parade is, now it's time to reject him for false teaching. To reject Him is the idea of refusing Him, shunning Him, and avoiding Him. Now, does it mean that we cannot have any contact with Him, but the contact that we have is contact in trying to win that brother back to the truth. Now let me just ask you this question. Someone did that, and we said, well, We've got to remove you from our church. And you go play basketball with them Saturday morning. What's that going to tell them? Well, it really wasn't that serious. We're still going to be friends. We're still going to get together. We're still going to do... No, 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 no. If it was serious enough that we had to take a stand, then we need to separate from them. Because we're trying to get their attention and trying to get them to understand the Scriptures. Then verse number 11 um, talked about this and said uh, the result there. uh, It said, knowing uh, that he that is such is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself. So there's three areas. There's There's a public offense that has to be responded to fairly quickly. 
because of the publicity or the public nature of the offense. Number two, oh, and, and let, me, let me back up and let me say this. That's one reason, that's one reason, not the only, but one reason I did go speak with Brother Kevin. Because now we have a responsibility as a church to respond to what's going on. So now if anybody asks me what's going on, I can say, well, here's what's going on. I can tell you, I've talked to him, we've talked about it, we've discussed it, and we're working with him. Because that's the truth. The personal offense, to go, they don't hear, go with two, one or two, go to the church, that we might regain that brother. And then the heretic, to admonish them twice, they won't respond to reject, number one, because he's condemned himself. Number two, because you don't want that heresy spreading through your church. And number three, because you're trying to gain the brother. And it's always done with that spirit, with that heart, and with that desire. You know, in closing, isn't it a wonderful thing how God put His Bible together? I mean, isn't it a wonderful thing how God gave us everything that we need to function from a heart of love and compassion? And He's laid it all out there for us that all we have to do is respond to what He said to From His heart. From His Spirit. And if we'll bathe that in prayer, and we'll seek the face of Christ, and we'll let the Holy Spirit do the work, nine times out of ten what I've seen, nine times out of ten what I've seen when it's done correctly, Maybe not at the moment. Maybe not at the day. But eventually, that brother, that sister, comes home with an understanding that even when I was unlovable, you loved me. Hmm. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? Because Christ, even when we were unlovable, of us. And that's the point. Are we showing forth Christ's love to others? Church discipline is an act of love. Just like you discipline your children is an act of love to correct them and help them. So is church discipline. Father, we're thankful for the night. Thankful for what you're doing in our lives. Thank you for the